Hi, uh, so as mentioned, um, my name's Lucy McKenna, and uh, just to give you a little bit of information about myself, um, I'm a PhD student I'm in computer science, um, and I'm part of the ADAPT uh, Centre in Trinity College Dublin, and um, ADAPT is a computer science research centre uh, that's based across Trinity, DCU, DIT, and UCD, and, um, and I'll be joined in this presentation by Marta, and uh, she's currently working as college liaison librarian in UCD. Um, so um, basically, um, we did this project in collaboration with the Digital Resources and Imaging Services um, in Trinity College Dublin. And um, just to give you a little bit of information about DRIS, um, it hosts the Digital Collections Repository of TCD, um, and that provides open access to the university's collection of uh, digital cultural heritage materials. So that includes books, maps, and drawings, and manuscripts. Um, and basically, uh, DRIS hopes to move towards publishing their bibliographic metadata as linked data in the future um, to provide basically easier interlinking with other cultural heritage um, resources and to increase the visibility of their metadata. Um, however, they found that their current um, software setup um, wasn't suitable for publishing um, to the semantic web, and so that's what inspired um, this collaboration. Uh, so, basically, just to give you a little bit of information about the semantic web and linked data. Um, so, the semantic web um, can be considered a web of data where the relationships between data are defined in a, co a common machine readable format. And linked data refers to a set of best practices and guidelines for publishing and interlinking data sets on the semantic web. And so that includes um, using URIs to identify and retrieve entities and using the resource description framework to re represent these entities and to uh, represent their interlinks. Um, so an RDF um, takes a statement takes the form of a triple and so that uh, consists of a subject, predicate and object um, and it requires the use of URIs to identify the subjects and the predicates, sorry, so, the so the relationship between the subject and the object. And uh, the resulting data um, allows for both human and computer-based agents to crawl, explore, and discover things on the semantic web. Um, so why engage with the semantic web? Um, so sharing library metadata on the semantic web um, allows for metadata be to be freed from institutional databases. And so this can increase the visibility and use of the resources and um, expose data to a larger audience, um, increase metadata sharing and accessibility between libraries, um, improve metadata quality. Um, and interlinking of resources across institutions can improve um, search accuracy and provide more efficient searching and basically allow library users to access a web of data uh, from a single information search. So um, the role of the librarian in the semantic web. So um, some may argue that uh, linked data could be generated by technical experts or by crowdsourcing. Um, however, um, we believe that librarians actually have a lot to offer in terms of creating linked data. Um, so we believe that linked data from authoritative sources, such as li libraries, um, would, be would be treated with an increased degree of credibility, so therefore be likely to be used with um, increased frequency. Um, and also, librarians are experts in using controlled authorities and vocabularies. Um, so this would allow for the consistent identification of entities um, on the semantic web. Um, many of these authorities and vocabularies are already available as linked data. And, um, and also, uh, using these vocabularies would allow for more detailed and more accurate searches. Um, however, um, there are a number um, of challenges um, for libraries in participating in the semantic web. Um, one of these is that there's um, limited tools um, for non-technical experts and also that the tools that are available aren't aimed at the needs of libraries and don't do exactly what the librarians need them to do. Um, so um, in 2015, OCLC did a survey investigating the use of linked data in libraries. Um, some of the benefits included um, that uh, the librarians felt that using linked data exposed their data to a larger audience, um, enhanced the library's metadata, and improved search accuracy. However, they reported a large number of barriers for them participating in the semantic web. Um, these included that there were few examples of useful library applications of using linked data. Um, so basically, they were finding it hard to justify putting the time and resources uh, into creating linked data 
um, as they couldn't really see what it would provide them in, compared to, in comparison to what they already had. Um, difficulties incorporating linked data into existing workflows, so some of the software was quite restrictive that, that they were using. Um, difficulty establishing links between the resources and lack of authority control on the semantic web. Um, so basically um, these challenges were also experienced by DRIS and um, so this led to us deciding to design a bespoke cataloging interface for DRIS that would allow them to generate uh, bibliographic records in RDF. Um, and we decided um, that these bibliographic records would be uh, generated using the using MODS, so the Metadata Object Description Schema. Um, so basically what this, what MODS is, is an XML-based uh, metadata schema um, that provides a bibliographic element set um, that can be used to catalogue library materials. Um, it was developed by the Mark Standards Office at the Library of Congress in response to a need for a simplified XML version of Mark 21. So it's less complex than MARC, but it provides, um, it's a richer alternative to other metadata schemas such as Dublin Core. Um, and it allows for the display of hierarchical relationships within, to, and from resources. Um, and also, um, there is already a MODS RDF ontology available, so um, that can be used to represent bibliographic data as linked data, so that was already completed for us. And um, also the Digital Library Federation's Aquifer initi Initiative, they published a set of implementation guidelines that basically um, instructed which elements would be required um, to provide uh, when publishing a record and uh, which elements would be recommended and that would ensure the quality and consistency of MODS records across institutions and allow for the metadata to be more interoperable. Um, and I didn't mention previously, but uh, MODS has 20 top level elements, so that would be like title, subject, uh, name, and within these uh, elements um, there are a number of sub-elements, so for example subtitle or first name, last name, um, and, within, and also each um, element has a number of attributes that would describe the metadata, so for example the language used. Um, so uh, we um, decided to design the interface using a user-centered approach, um, so basically designing from the user's perspective, and that's where the importance of our collaboration with, the, uh, with Marta came in. Um, and so the first phase of this was requirements gathering. So basically um, I interviewed um, Marta and we uh, together came up with um, a number of requirements for the tool. Um, so that basically, um, uh, these turned out to be that uh, to facilitate the timely and efficient creation of records um, by automating input as much as possible and that, to, that the records produced would uh, meet the DLF uh, requirements and standards. Um, and. Yeah, so it's basically to make the cataloging process as quick and efficient as possible. Um, so the second phase involved uh, designing a mock-up, um, and basically once this was approved, um, we went on with the coding process. Um, so basically the interface, uh, the homepage of the interface, you can see the list of records that have been created, and you can also create a new record. And when you enter, um, into a record, you're able to see each of the elements on the top of the screen, and you're able to see the sub-elements, the required sub-elements for, for that element um, lower down. Um, and then, so when you click into an element, um, as mentioned, we wanted to make sure that each record created um, would meet the minimal standards of a record as per the DLF guidelines. So basically, um, when you click into an element, the on initially the only sub-element that you see are the sub-elements that are required. So for example, here in title, <coughs> in title info, um, title is a required sub-element. So you're unable to sort of enter any other information in until you've got that minimal piece of information in at first. So basically this would ensure that all the data met, uh, or the records met the requirements. Um, so once you complete that um, initial step, um, the interface opens up to reveal the recommended sub-elements and attributes, and also, as this was a bespoke tool for address, um, there were some, ele some elements that weren't necessarily recommended, but were optional, but that they wanted to be able to see on the initial view as well. Um, so in this case, um, this will be the attribute of dis display label, which basically just allows you to provide extra information around the elements that um, you're using. Um, so, um, yep. then the next step, um, so as mentioned, um, 
we wanted to make the cataloging process as smooth as possible. Um, so the, based on your previous decisions um, in, your, in the cataloging process, um, certain drop-down menus were programmed to dynamically alter. So basically here, you can see that when you're choosing the authority for the name of the author, um, for instance, um, the list of authorities comes down here. Um, so basically, there were 19 authorities recommended by uh, the DLF Aquifer Guidelines, but um, only how many, seven of these were regularly used by DRIS. So these were the only ones that we made available um, at that time. So basically, in order to, to prevent having to scroll through a, a larger list, uh, the commonly used ones were the initial ones that can be seen. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and also, um, to make the process uh, more quicker, um, so when you selected an authority, um, so the things like the authority URI and the value URI um, self-populated, so these didn't have to be copy and pasted or manually entered. Um, so again, saving time and preventing errors. Um, and let's see here. And then the next step that we did was um, so that, so here you can see again the auto populating URI values based on your selection for, say, the author. Um, so once we completed the interface, um, we did some usability testing. Um, so basically this consisted of a think aloud observation. So um, I asked Marta to use the tool and to uh, provide verbal feedback on how she was finding the tool. And also I observed how she was able to use the tool and whether she came into any difficulties. <coughs> I also asked her to complete a questionnaire um, and this measured the usability and the utility of the tool. Um, and basically in the results, we found that um, the, some of the layout um, of the fields and buttons that we needed to make it more clear and more streamlined, and we also identified new requirements for the tool, such as providing um, interlinking um, rather than just publishing RDF as a um, so means for interlinking as well. Um, so then, in terms of generating the mods RDF, um, so basically, uh, data entered in the in interface um, is saved to a relational database, and then we used an R2 RML mapping um, to take the information from the relational, da relational database and publish it as mods RDF. Um, so R2 RML is a W3C recommendation for declaring mappings from relat relatable da relational databases to RDF data sets. Um, and so using these mappings, RDF records were generated. Um, so here's an example of the R2, uh, R2RML mapping, um, and this is an example of the um, the, excuse me, the published uh, mods records. And then this is an example of a Sparkle query, so we were able to run over the mods RDF. So basically, uh, it's a query language that you can use to search your RDF um, records. Um, so we were able to complete more detailed searches. Um, using Sparkle. Um, so example, some of the queries were like searching by author, searching by title or abstract, and then publishing detailed authoritative bibliographic records on RDF also allowed for more specific searches, such as searching by um, Library of Congress subject heading or genre and form terms. Um, so one of the challenges that we came into, however, was that we found that the published mods RDF records were missing um, some information, some authoritative information, and basically this data is part of what's called MADS RDF, um, and MADS uh, stands for um, the Metadata Authority Description Schema, so it's similar to MODS um, and can be used in conjunction with MODS. Um, so basically we had to also create an R2RML mapping for MADS, however, um, we found that there was an issue with this. Um, so basically, um, some of the MADS entities are grouped in collections. Um, and what this allows for is that, so say an item like a title, um, when you publish the RDF, um, it is displayed in order of, um, so say title, subtitle, or that the name of an author is displayed as first name, last name. Um, however, R2RML didn't allow for the uplift of um, collections um, into MADS RDF. So this inspired um, another project, which was to develop an R2RML extension, which would allow for um, uplifting um, the MADS collections um, into MADS RDF. And so basically, what we learned from the collaboration, um, what I learned personally was I understood the role of libraries in the development of the semantic web and the importance of including libraries in the semantic web. Um, I, we identified um, a need in the library domain. Excuse me. Oops, I went back. 
um, a need in the library domain um, for more bespoke tools um, for libraries and for tools that would target the needs of librarians and um, the tools that weren't just um, based, weren't, weren't just aimed at technical experts, but aimed at librarians. Um, we, I designed the bespoke, it was a bespoke tool for DRIS, so a lot of uh, the tool does target DRIS's needs. And um, also identified areas for future research, so such as the OrtoRML extension, as I mentioned, um, and an L uh, linked data interlinking tool as well, so to providing the next step, so not just publishing RDF, but also being able to interlink between institutions, um, so basically realizing uh, the aim of the semantic web. So now I will hand you over to Marta, who will speak about um, how she found the project from the library's perspective. I thought I would show you a pretty picture after that. <laughs> um, okay, so from the library's perspective, um, collaborating with computer science and with the ADAPT Center was really interesting because it allowed us to learn a number of things. Um, it allowed us to explore our own processes and to learn about how we communicate with researchers. Um, when this project started, I had already been um, a cataloger in DRIS, which publishes the digital collections um, data, uh, for about two and a half years. So I was very familiar with both the strengths and the limitations of our database software and our repository. And I had also participated in a demonstrator project with the Digital Repository of Ireland, where we had exported data from our bespoke database as mods, and I had participated in the mapping of our data to the mod standard. So already there was a, a bit of groundwork already done that helped us. Um, oh, sorry. I already knew that we wanted a fully mods compliant cataloging tool, which we didn't have at the time. Um, and this would al allow us three things. It would al allow us to establish hierarchies between different parts of our collections and to express relationships between objects. So for instance, if we had a document that was related to a photograph, um, there was no way we could do it the way the, the software we had at the, at the time but this would allow us to do that. And the other one, thing that I really, really wanted was that our database wasn't allowing us to identify which authorities we, we were using for subject cataloging and for genre and all those kinds of things. Um, but there was also what Dries wanted, which was as part of the library strategy, the, um, there was a great emphasis on research collaborations with areas outside the library within the university. Um, we also knew that we wanted to set up easy browsing on digital collections and that we knew we needed to change our data model to be able to do that. Um, we knew that we wanted to standardize our metadata so that it could be easily harvested by aggregators such as Europeana. And then I personally knew that I wanted to integrate li link data into the cataloging uh, workflow, not for churning out link data from our own data, but because I wanted to be able to use link data sets into our own cataloging. Um, so then what we learned eventually, um, and I have to say that Something that Lucy hasn't said is that as well as being a PhD student uh, in computer science, she's also an MLIS. And that has a huge effect because she was able to understand what I was trying to say from the library point of view and translate it into computer science speech. Um, it allows us to have a better understanding of our own cataloging processes and what we needed. But most importantly and crucially for me, it was the importance of making our own expertise within the library visible to other areas of the university. Thank you.